Well, good morning. Uh, it's November 22nd. It's our Sunday morning service. As I get ready to preach, I just want to say hi to my church family as I am still in quarantine and uh, should be getting released from it actually today or tomorrow. Uh, I'm doing pretty good. A little bit of fatigue still, a little bit of uh, sore, th- uh, not sore throat, but cough. And uh, Leah's uh, doing decently as well. Occasionally she gets a really bad headache and she's got fatigue. Anyways, um, I'm reading this morning from Psalm 145. I'm going to read the whole psalm. So um, follow along. There's no PowerPoint today. Uh, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another, shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word today, give me your wisdom and clarity. Help those listening live uh, or in person, I should say, in church, or we'll see this later. Lord, just use your word, help them to understand it, to apply it, help us to be thankful. And I pray that you would just use this message today for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's so ironic that in a year that has thrown a mysterious pandemic at us, in a couple months of sheltering in place, then a tentative return to normal, And then a contentious year of protests against officers of the law and a controversial election filled with even more strife and anxiety than usual. We come to the Sunday before Thanksgiving Day and your pastor is delivering the message via YouTube as he finishes up his quarantine from uh, testing positive for COVID. So the obvious question is, how do we sincerely give praise, the key word being sincerely, for 2020? When 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us to give thanks in everything, uh, does that really include a nation with so many, uh, with many seeming to promote lawlessness? How does one sincerely give thanks for COVID and all that it has done to alter our lives and create such an atmosphere of fear and anxiety? And what about the election? We can't even be 100% sure who has won it yet, and regardless of who that is, about half of our nation will be hopeful, while the other half thinks that our country is doomed never to survive the next four years. Well, the answer lies in this wonderful psalm, written by the godliest human king in human history. A king who took a monarchy in its infancy and was used by God to lead it to heights that no other nation has ever seen or will ever see again until the Lord returns? Well, the answer is that this mighty king, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the giant killer, uh, the commander-in-chief who led Israel's armies in triumph over many enemies, understood that none of that ultimately was of his own doing, but it was the doing of his king and our king. 
the king whose dominion is spoken of in this passage of scripture and whose rule is clearly described in this passage of scripture, both the rule that he has right now as the universal king of all things, a king that sovereignly looks over his creation and rules it in a way that uh, right now allows for sin, allows for Satan, allows for disease because of the curse. Now I want you to notice verse 1 through 3, even just by way of introduction. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. <laughs> Folks, these are not the words of someone whose reign or life was easy, who had a reign that had no enemies. David was the king who had so many battles and had such warfare that God wouldn't allow him to build the temple because he was a man of war. He certainly was a king who had controversies and pestilences. On one occasion, he actually was the cause of a terrible pestilence that claimed uh, tens of thousands of lives because of the judgment of God. So these are not the words of someone who had this idyllic, perfect little reign without any problems. But these are the words of someone who truly understood praise and who, who understood who was worthy of it and why. And folks, the, the sermon in a sentence is this, only when you can learn and daily apply who alone is worthy to be praised and why he's worthy to be praised will you be able to sincerely give thanks even for the worst of times. You see, when your daily focus is on God's rule as king, your heart will be sincerely thankful amidst the worst of times. Let me repeat that. That's your sermon in the sentence. When your daily focus is on God's rule as king, your heart will be sincerely thankful amidst the worst of times. Did you notice the focus of David's exhortation or praise? It's all about God's rule. It's not about circumstances. It's not about him. It's not about what God has done through him. It's all about God. There's no mention of specific circumstances that David is thankful for, though he could have listed many and there would have been nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, as we think of praise and we think of being thankful in all things, our focus has to be on God. And no matter what's going on, we can always be thankful when our focus is on God. If you keep, your focusing, if you keep focusing on circumstances, then rather than the God who rules over them, then you will struggle greatly to be sincerely thankful. So let's allow this great human king to show us how to humbly acknowledge God and acknowledge the worthiness of the king of the universe to be praised at all times. First of all, God's people committed to praise for his righteous rule. That's the first seven verses. We see a, a more general... <clears throat> explanation of how God's people need to be committed to praise, or we can see his example of it, because of God's righteous rule. Notice the personal focus. Letter A in my outline is your personal focus and commitment to praise, uh, to praise his righteous rule. The first three verses, we see this real personal focus. You see the, uh, the personal pronoun, I. I will extol you, my God and King. I will bless your name forever. Every day I will bless you. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. So before David starts trying to challenge us to be people of praise or to encourage those that around him to be people of praise, he wants to make it very clear that this is his life. This is what he is doing. And again, David is focused on God and God's rule. I will extol you, my God and King. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And he'll do so every day, forever and ever. <clears throat> David's praise was consistent. It was not deterred by the events of his life, but it centered on the faithful character of his God. And that's what our praise needs to be on. It's not going to be consistent when we're focused on the news or focused on what's going around us or we're focused on our circumstances, like getting sick or, you know, having problems at work. So the real application right away is this your daily focus. Is God, his sovereignty, his, his glorious rule over the world and over our lives, is that your focus? 
Or have you gotten your eyes off of uh, the true king? Maybe you've gotten your eyes onto earthly kings. Certainly during this election year, that is a huge problem. And I'm going to be making some very pointed applications about that. The president of the United States is not our king. He's, it shouldn't affect our emotions. It shouldn't affect our spiritual lives about who's in the White House or who wins the election. You see, praise is worship. Praise is acknowledging God to be God. And despite all the success of David's reign and all the outward blessings that came from his reign, his focus was not on himself. He was not considering himself as the one that made Israel great. He knew it wasn't him. He was an instrument. He was a tool, just like we've been seeing in the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar was a tool. And God has to remind him several times and humble him for him to learn that he's just God's tool. And God brings us leaders who are instruments. <laughs> I'm trying to resist the using the word tool because that could have a double meaning, a little pun. But no pun intended. Uh, whoever is the next president of the United States is simply a tool, an instrument that God's going to use. He may be using him to exalt our nation. He may be using him to humble it. But either way, we can praise God because that's God's plan. That's what needs to be done. And we can trust him. So I wonder, a little application, a very pointed one, I, want, I wonder what God thinks of all the praise, or I can say it this way, of all the credit, including that people, including Christians, give of their human leaders and their governors and their presidents. We're to respect them, the Bible says. We're to pray for them. We're to submit to our human authorities, but we are not to ascribe to them praise, as if they're the key to our country's success. Or, even in the negative, that they're the key to our country's downfall or lack of success. Even though, from a human standpoint, they do things that do cause our country to be better off economically or worse off, etc., etc. I'm not saying that they don't. But when our hope is in them and we start ascribing to them this, uh, you know, really, our future depends on them. We are ascribing to a person something that should only be ascribed to God. Folks, that's idolatry. Idolatry 101. Idolatry is when we ascribe praise and honor to someone or something that belongs only to God. So if you think America's been in better shape the last four years and you're ascribing that all to Donald Trump, you're committing idolatry. When you look at the, the future and whoever's going to be president and you make decisions about what your life's going to be like as if, you know, they're in total control of everything, that's idolatry. Plain and simple. You may not like me saying it, but I don't care because you need to hear it. God is the king of the universe. And so when our focus is on him, we can be thankful for what's going on. We can praise, we can trust, we can be totally sincere and not just... Oh, yeah, I, I've got to say I'm thankful because that's what the Bible says. But everything else about how I act and how I think and what I say in general conversation demonstrates that I don't really trust God with this. I, I'm struggling. Praise is worship. It's acknowledging God to be God. And when we do that in the actual practical day, the day context of our lives, that we can praise God even amidst the worst of times, as well as the best of times. Notice, secondly, the people's focus. He shifts from this personal, um, these personal statements of his praise to, and we're still kind of in the general part of the psalm, but the, the people's focus. Verse 4, One generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on, the, on the, your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome Deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing a lot of your righteousness. Notice how he's he's going, he's shifting the focus to they, but he's also including himself. He's saying they and I. They will praise, they will pass uh, this praise on from one generation to another. I will meditate. As we think of the outline, basically here, the people's focus and commitment to praise underneath that is, number one, the responsibility of God's people to praise him. 
the responsibility of God's people to praise him. Folks, if we don't give God the credit for what's going on in our lives, what's going on in our country, what, then who's going to? Who's going to? And we notice here that praise is a powerful teaching tool. One generation shall commend your works to another. They shall speak of your awesome deeds. You see, your praise is powerful, and your lack of praise is powerful too. When we complain, when we get nervous, when we get anxious, and we start talking like that, hey, the next generation, if you still have kids at home, or if you influence kids at school, you're a teacher or whatever, they're listening. They're reading your posts. And they're learning something about who your trust is in. And that is causing us to lead others away from or towards trusting God as our king. So based on your words, not in church, but your general conversation, your praise to God or lack of praise to God, what is the next generation learning about God's rule? Many teenagers and young adults right now really need encouragement about their future. Uh, they're worried. Parents are worried. Uh, COVID-19, is this going to be around forever? Or are we going to spend the rest of our lives having to be socially distanced and wonder if we can get through a school year in person? I mean, all these things. Imagine what this is like for teenagers and young adults and college students. Well, their focus is only going to be shifted towards God and God's rule if those older than them, those more spiritually mature than them are focused that way. They need to be taught, just like I'm reminding you and teaching you where our focus needs to be. That's the responsibility of God's people to praise him. And secondly, under the people's focus and commitment is the reason for God's people to praise him. Look at verse 10. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall, make, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom. See, this is... The reason for God's people to praise him is that God rules. And there's going to be a shift in this psalm. I believe verse 13 especially is that shift where we go from this uh, general rule over the universe to the eternal kingdom that we have to look forward to. Verse 13 says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. So there's going to come a point in time where we're not going to be talking in in the more general sense of God's universal rule, but we're still living in this sin-cursed world and we're still dealing with sin. We wait for that glorious day when our kingdom, the kingdom of God will be literally here on the new earth. Sin will be gone. Curse of sin will be gone. We will have our glorified bodies. We will rule and reign with him. And I see that shift in verse 13 because this earth and this kingdom rule of God does not last forever and ever. It does not last uh, for all generations. It gives way to, to the final expression of it, which is, of course, eternity, where there is no sin. So the reason for God's people to praise him. Matter of fact, notice in verses 14 through 21, we're going to be getting to the specifics of that in just a minute and next point. But notice um, the future tense and the climactic uh, emphasis. There's a lot of shalls in here that can be present tense, but all, are also perfect or uh, future tense. And while verses 14 through 21 give specifics about God's character and his rule overall, uh, here the emphasis in the passage we've just been looking at is the overall truth that regardless of what's happening today, here in your life, Regardless of what's happening today in our country, in our current world context, your future and the future of all of God's people is glorious. It's full of splendor. It's absent of any reason to be distressed. Yes, all his saints will bless him in eternity. But what about now? Are we blessing him now? You have every reason to be thankful. You have every reason to daily offer up praise from a sincere heart full of faith because God is on his throne. 
And you know what? I get tired of seeing people post thoughts like this. But then when I see them respond to other posts, when I hear them talk, when I'm around them, I see something totally different. We love to post how spiritual we are, and maybe at those moments we're just having our, our strong faith. But folks, that's got to be every day. It's got to be daily. It's got to come through our conversation, come through our actions. Otherwise, we're just playing the game. And God knows the difference. God knows our heart. He knows how much we're trusting in him and how much we're not. So let's trust him more. So when you're having trouble, and I know and at times, all of us, you know, at times, including myself, for sure, we've had some trouble <laughs> giving thanks for 2020. But remember, God is sovereign over 2020. Do you realize that? 2020 was not like some big mistake that he just blew it. He was sleeping. He's sovereign over 2020. This is all God's plan. Now, how God's plan works with People's evil and, and sin, you know what? That's another conversation. But that's part of trusting God and understanding that God and his sovereign rule has allowed sin, has allowed the curse. So these things are going to be a part of it. But through it all, God has purposes for this. And we may not like some of his purposes because his purposes often include judgment. Certainly, these kinds of things are bringing some kind of judgment. I'm not making a statement about judging a particular person or, or a particular country, but God judges sin. And if you don't like that, if you think that's some kind of crazy notion, then I, I urge you to study the Bible more. And God brings throughout time, always has and will until his coming. will use diseases and leaders and different things to bring judgment. When your daily focus is on God's rule, your heart will sincerely be thankful amidst the worst of time. So let's get into the, now the more specific part of the psalm. And that's the second main point. The character of your king in this kingdom is the basis of your praise. Let me repeat that. The character of your king and his kingdom is the basis of your praise. When our focus is on our king and his character, how he's going to rule, what he's like, and what his kingdom is like, both now and especially in the future, then we won't have a problem with our praise. Do you ever wish we didn't have to go through elections every four years? I do. Wouldn't it be great just to have a really good godly president and let him stay in office indefinitely? Now, just so I'm not misunderstood. We don't have, on either side of the corn, a really great godly president. One might be better politically than others, than the other, but I'm not talking about either of these, uh, our president or president-elect. I'm talking about a really godly man who loves God, who's really good it, politically and, and spiritually and so forth. Wouldn't it be great just to let him stay in office? Now, for those of you who think our system is best and a monarchy is frightening, well, that's something I agree with you, only because of the potential to have a wicked king. You see, the ideal I just presented mm, isn't going to exist, is it? Oh, but it will. It's called the theocracy. It's called Jesus Christ being our king and dwelling, literally dwelling upon the earth in his eternal kingdom. You see, that's, that's God's best form of government. And even though monarchies to us are not a good form of government, they're not only because of sin. But a monarchy where God is the monarch, we call that a theocracy, that is the ultimate form of government because we can't lose. We're always going to have the absolutely holy, righteous God as our king. And the psalm gives us a great look of what kind of rule we actually enjoy today that we lose perspective of. Um, because God is in control, because God is sovereign, as well as what we're going to enjoy now. So let's run through this. Uh, first of all, God's universal rule that we enjoy now. Um, a general praise of his glorious works in verses 4 through 7, verse 11 and 12. I've already read these verses for the sake of time. I just want to kind of quickly summarize. Notice the different references here in these verses, 4 through 7, 11 through 12. And notice his mighty acts. We see the emphasis of his majesty, his mighty acts, his wondrous works, his awesome deeds, his greatness, his abundant goodness. He's good to all. He's gracious and merciful. 
He's abounding in steadfast love. These are all things that are true of God that we see flushed out in life today. We don't wait for a future to see this good God. If you can't see this good God in, in, his, in the scripture and in your life and in throughout history as you look back at things, then you just don't have the right biblical lens on your glasses. God is a good God. Every perfect gift comes from God, comes from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow or turning. And so, instead of focusing on what he's allowing to take place due to the curse of sin, we need to focus on God, and that God is still God, and he's worthy to be praised, despite what we may be tempted to think sometimes when trials come and tests come that cause us pain and struggles. That doesn't contradict his goodness. It doesn't contradict the fact that he's in control and that he has absolute control over all that's going on in the world. Within that control, he allows sin. He allows sinners. He allows people to make sinful decisions. Difficult stuff to wrap our head around, but it's what we have to wrap our head around if we're going to fully trust him. Let's go to the specifics of his glorious works in verses 14 through 21. Notice the psalm is still focusing on what God is doing for us now. Not only is he focusing on what God is doing for us now, he talks a lot about what God is doing for creation, for the animal kingdom, and for nature. First of all, notice his mercy and grace to all. Verse 8 and 9, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Again, he's not just talking about God's goodness towards people, although we are the height of his creation. But his goodness and his mercy is over all that he has made. Everything. So anytime you struggle to praise and be thankful because times are hard, again, you, you need to understand that we don't deserve anything. God is a creator, we're his creation, so there's nothing that we deserve. It's all of grace. If there's nothing that we deserve, then when God takes away some things that we enjoy, when God takes away some times of peace and times of ease, we didn't deserve it anyways. Everything we have, we owe to God. Our health, our lack of health, our, our finances, our ability to meet and worship, the ability just to enjoy going to a restaurant and having a nice meal, those are all blessings from God. You know, this entire pandemic has really shown us what we take for granted, hasn't it? When we were sheltering in place and we couldn't meet, uh, man, we miss church like we've not missed church on a normal day. We miss it sometimes, but not like that. I miss being around the young people and teaching them. Uh, and I think all the teachers and the students missed us. <laughs> that was fun to see. But um, we miss things that we take for granted. I mean, just being able to go to a restaurant and eat. We couldn't do it for a while, and we really missed that. Those things aren't like life or death, at least that one. But, again, it's not until something is removed from us that we really appreciate it like we should. And so sometimes it's just good to have that perspective on trials. That we can realize how much we take for granted. And if we take something for granted, we're obviously not being as thankful for it or praising God for it like we should. Psalm 116, verse 12 and verse 17 says this. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? Then verse 17 answers the question. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I want you to be looking at your Bible right now to verses 14 through 21. Look at all the alls, A-L-L, -L, that's in this passage. The Lord upholds all who are falling. He raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. Again, not just people, but every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. Are you circling them? This is what I do. Uh, your Bible should be something you're free to write in and anything that can help you understand it better or to highlight things. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. 
My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits? Well, Psalm 145 has just listed several of them. And at the top of the list is salvation, is his grace and his mercy. That's what verse 8 emphasizes, his grace and merciful, he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God has poured out his gifts to us, which is what grace means. And at the top of that list is salvation. If you're not saved, you're not going to be able to be thankful. Not in its fullest sense, because you don't know the Lord. You know of the Lord, but you don't know the Lord. So I want to challenge you this morning uh, out on YouTube and anybody in our congregation. Uh, are you thankful to God for sending his son to die on the cross for you, for your sins? That's where your whole spirit of thankfulness needs to start, is to be saved, to be trusting in him, to be trusting in his mercy and his grace and his son, Jesus Christ. Secondly, we see his that we need to be thankful for the specific blessing of his strengthening of the weak and the wayward. Look at verse 14. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. This year certainly has had a lot of people bow down a little bit. We're struggling. It's difficult to keep our praise, to keep our faith strong. But this truth goes way beyond uh, some of what we've been dealing with, you know, regarding the pandemic and so forth. It really goes to the people that are really at the bottom of the barrel for other reasons. You know, they might be homeless. They, they might have an illness and they're just really down. They're struggling with depression. And the Bible says the Lord upholds all those who are fallen. You know what? It's probably a reference, no doubt, also to those that are falling into sin, especially his, his people, his children, and he's holding them. He's, he's trying to woo them back to repentance, but he's not going to let them go because we're saved by grace through faith. And that grace is a gift of God that we shall not lose. So if you're in that place today, you need to remember what verse 8 says. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So his strengthening of the weak and wayward. Next, his provision for all of his creation. I love this. Verse 15, 16. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. Well, it's hunting season, as you know, and it's the peak of hunting season. And I love, I, I've really struggled this week. I've not been able to get out and go hunting. Uh, I did go a little bit on Thursday night just because I was starting to feel good enough. and I, But uh, just for a couple hours. But um, I love watching, of course, I really love watching deer and having an opportunity to maybe harvest one. But... Uh, most of the time, you're not watching deer. Most of the time, you're hearing squalls. You know what? The squalls are annoying because they sound like deer coming into the woods. But I do get a kick out of them because they're 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 cutting the acorns down out of the tree, which is candy, especially white oak for deer. Deer candy, as my buddy Fred Bennett calls it. And so they're they're dropping those acorns, but they're really not dropping them for the deer. God is using them to drop them for the deer. God is feeding the deer. God is feeding the squirrels, and he's using them. But what I really get a kick out of is when I watch a squirrel, um, whether it's a, an acorn or, or some other kind of nut, chestnut, whatever, he, he gets it, and you see him go down off the tree, or you see him get one from the ground and start burying it somewhere and hiding it. He's hiding it for when winter comes in. He's hiding it for when um, the acorns are no longer on the tree. As hunters, we talk about the acorns being all gone because they've dropped and the deer have eaten whatever has been dropped, most of them, and it looks like they don't have a source for food like that right now. Uh, but the acorns aren't gone. They might be gone for the deer, but the squirrels have buried a bunch of them. And uh, they're going to find them and eat them for winter. So it's just amazing to see how God fulfills his word, how he provides for all of his creation. Every instinct they have. Every provision, everything they do to be able to eat and survive, that all comes from God. It doesn't come from Mother Nature. Folks out there that 
refer to Mother Nature, you are replacing God with an evolutionary concept. And that is big time idolatry. If you're going to be thankful to God, you need to be thankful to God. God is the creator. Nothing else. No one else. God has made and he will sustain his creation. We need to be thankful for that. This is not a king who's worried about a shortage of natural resources for you. He's not worried about climate change. He's not worried about this pandemic destroying the population of the earth. He's not worried about a, a, a different natural disaster that's going to run covered and dry because God is God and he's going to sustain his creation. Does he allow difficult times? Yes. Does he allow pandemics? Yes. Does he allow shortages of food at times? Yes. But God is going to provide for his people and he's going to put this earth isn't going to destroy itself. Man can't destroy it. He cannot. Or God is a liar because God has promised us that only he will destroy it at the end of time when he decides to make all sin be destroyed, all sin, all the curse of sin, and he'll create a new heaven, new earth that we will dwell on as his children. As heaven comes down, the holy city comes down, Revelation chapters 19, 20, 21. God isn't worried about the natural resources for this planet. You don't need to worry about it. We need to be good stewards. Well, that's two different things. Many times people that are go over the top are uh, have forgotten that God is in control of the environment. So they worry, they get anxious about all these things that people come up with, that unbelievers come up with, to replace God. Replace God with this concept that actually creation is God. That creation is, uh, you know, environmentalism becomes God. All these things become what we trust in instead of God. God takes care of all every living thing he will sustain his creation we need to be good stewards of it but we don't need to worry about the resources the cupboards running dry notice also his provision his presence and provision through prayer verse 18 and 19 the lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth he fulfills the desire of those who fear him he also hears their cry and saves them what an awesome king, and how different that is than from human kings. Human kings throughout the ages have not given people that kind of access. You don't have that kind of access in our country to the President of the United States, whoever he is. You can't call him on the phone. Oh, maybe if you win a Super Bowl or, you know, the Stanley Cup, you'll get a call from him. But the average guy can't call the President and ask him to do different things. You don't walk into a king's palace without being invited. You don't get on the White House lawn without being invited. You might be shot. But see, unlike human kings, God is near. You will not be denied access to his throne. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can call on him at any time, any place, and he hears your prayer. Folks, this is the world you live in. This is the king who you can trust. You need not fear. Your king is watching out for those who are his subjects, those enjoying life under his universal rule and looking forward to the most glorious life to come in his eternal kingdom. He's watching out for you. And so lastly, very quickly, as we wrap up, we see God's glorious rule over us in his eternal kingdom. I've already read verse 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. And then the last two verses of this psalm the Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. That's the eternal kingdom. David encourages all flesh to praise and be thankful for God because of his glorious rule. And all the blessings that he gives to us, yet sadly many do not. And so David enters that little caveat in the end of verse 20, but all the wicked he will destroy. The eternal kingdom is only going to be for those that are saved. It's not for everyone that ever lives because there are those who don't trust in Christ. There are those that do and those that do not trust in Christ. The Bible says they have to pay for their own sin. He's already provided the way for them, but they've rejected it. It's not that he's not loving, but they've rejected his love. 
And so they become unthankful and they ascribe to someone or something else the glory that is only due God. Folks, I hope that's not you. Even as believers in Christ, we fall into that temptation. But you know what? God is slow to anger. He's forgiving God. And he loves you. So if you're his children, let's repent of our lack of faith. We probably have to do it every day. Let's daily praise him and focus on him. And if you're not one of his children, why not today? When your daily focus is on God's rule as king, your heart will be sincerely thankful amidst the worst of times. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. May it encourage us all, help us to live it out. We do thank you and praise you for who you are, and I thank you for the technology that allows me to preach to my congregation this morning without actually being there. Guide and direct us. May your word do great things in our hearts and lives, both of us and those who might watch it on uh, YouTube or in some other fashion. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.